Last week's vision ended with a rather grisly scene. After the wicked had been gathered from the vine of the earth and cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God, their blood covered the earth up to horses' bridles. Obviously, that's not a pretty picture. And few of us like to think of such things, but the reality of evil demands that it be dealt with. We can't ignore sin and expect it to go away. And God can't overlook sin and pretend it doesn't exist. Justice demands that God act in the face of sin and act he does. He doesn't jump right on it and nip it in the bud. In fact, he often allows it to go much further than we think he should. Who hasn't wondered why God didn't stop Hitler before he killed millions of people? Or why he didn't move to stop any atrocity, especially one that affected us or our loved ones? But then, who hasn't been grateful for the patience of God when it came to their own sins? We'd all be gone if a bolt of lightning struck sinners at their first or second or hundredth sin. So while we may not understand why God does what he does, when he does it, or allows what he allows, we do have assurances from Scripture that God will act. Sin will not be ignored. And the full wrath of God will be poured out on unrepentant sin. This truth is nowhere presented more graphically than in the visions of Revelation. And today we're going to see the bowls of God's wrath being poured out. First, we're going to see something that will assure us of the righteous nature of God's wrath. We're beginning with Revelation 15. John again is writing. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had come off victorious from the beast and from his image and from the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are thy ways, thou King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou alone art holy. For all the nations will come and worship before thee. For thy righteous acts have been revealed. After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their breasts with golden girdles. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. This scene opens with another sign in heaven. As John looked up, he saw seven angels with seven plagues that were about to be sent to earth as expressions of God's wrath. Now, we've seen plagues before in Revelation. At the sounding of the seven trumpets, 
Plagues were brought upon mankind to get them to repent of the works of their hands, to repent of their idolatries, their murders, their sorceries, their immoralities, and their thefts. Like, like trumpets sounding an alarm, God was warning mankind through nature, through personal anguish, and through the effects of sinful activity to repent. He was using calamity and woe to draw men to himself. But the vast majority did not heed the trumpets of warning. They did not repent. We're therefore going to be given a vision of another aspect of the calamities that are sent upon mankind. We're about to see how some of these same things serve not as warnings, but as expressions of the wrath of God. Before we come to that, however, the scene changes, and John's attention is drawn once again to the court of heaven, and there he sees those who have come off victorious from the beast, his image, and the number of his name. This vision looks to the future, showing those who refuse to bow the knee to Caesar and those down through the ages who remain faithful in the face of any beast they might encounter. The victorious are shown singing praises to God, standing before him on the sea of glass we first saw in the fourth chapter, a sea of glass that formed a crystal floor under the throne of God, a floor that reflected the glory of God that emanated from the throne. But here... We're told the sea of glass was mixed with fire, making it clear that the wrath of God also emanates from the throne. We're then told that these victors are singing a song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. They sing, great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are thy ways, thou King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou alone art holy. For all the nations will come and worship before thee. For thy righteous acts have been revealed. Now, why this is called the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, we can only speculate. Some have noted a similarity to the song Moses led the children of Israel in singing after they crossed the Red Sea and the Egyptian soldiers had been drowned. And that's a possibility. However, it's perhaps even more likely that this is intended to be a condensed version of the song Moses sang to Israel just before he died. A song he sang after finishing the book of the law and placing it beside the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. In that song, he warned Israel about the dangers of provoking God's anger by going after idols and ignoring his laws. And he declared that nations that took advantage of Israel's periods of chastisement would suffer the consequences of an angry God. The song concluded with the following words. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for his land and his people. All were admonished to rejoice when justice prevailed, and the nations were warned that God would render vengeance on his adversaries and make atonement for his people. The song in the vision was preceded by angels bringing plagues that would express the wrath of God, followed by the pouring out of the bowls of his wrath. It looks as if the righteous acts extolled by the saints were the acts of God's wrath prophesied in Moses' song, acts that are confirmed as being righteous and true. The fact that this is also referred to as the song of the Lamb indicates that even the Lamb of God recognizes the necessity of God's judgment 
and the righteousness of his wrath. We often think of God as a God of wrath and Jesus as a God of grace. But nothing could be further from the truth. The Father and the Son are one in grace and wrath. After having this confirmed, John watched as the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels who had the plagues came out of the temple dressed in celestial garb. Now, the temple John saw was more like the tabernacle that was built in the wilderness than the temples of stone that were later constructed. The tabernacle that was even referred to as the tent of testimony because within it was kept the law of God. You know, if questions ever arose about God's activity, all that needed to be done was read what he said he would do and why. And that could be found in the written testimony kept in the tabernacle. That seems to confirm that the song of Moses mentioned here was the song he sang after placing the law beside the Ark of the Covenant and declaring that it would remain there as a witness against them. That also makes it clear that these angels weren't sent forth because of a divine temper tantrum. They came forth because of God's eternal commitment to seeing that justice is done and that unrepentant sin is punished. John then notes that one of the four living creatures that surround the throne gave the angels bowls, golden bowls, full of the wrath of God. And that the temple was so filled with smoke, indicative of God's presence and wrath, that no one could enter the temple until the angels had fulfilled their mission. It was too late for anyone to come into the presence of God and intercede for themselves or others. It was time for the seven bowls of the wrath of God to be poured out upon the earth. And we read of that in the 16th chapter. And I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of the wrath of God into the earth. And the first angel went and poured out his bowl into the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore upon the men who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. And the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous art thou who art and who wast, O holy one, because thou didst judge these things, for they poured out the blood of the saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, righteous and true are thy judgments. Let's stop there for a moment. Do these bowls sound familiar to you at all? They should. Because in many respects, they are similar to the trumpets of warning we've already looked at. The first trumpet, you may recall, caused hail and fire mixed with blood to be thrown to the earth, burning up one-third of the trees and all the grass. This first bowl was likewise poured out upon the earth, but its effects were seen on the men who had worshipped the beast, not on the trees or the grass. The men were covered with loathsome and malignant sores. At the sounding of the second trumpet, something like a great burning mountain was thrown into the sea and one-third of the sea became blood, killing one-third of the creatures that lived in the sea and destroying one-third of the ships that sailed on it. The second bowl was likewise poured out into the sea 
and it became like the blood of a dead man, coagulated and decaying, and everything in the sea died. When the third trumpet sounded, a star fell from heaven into the rivers and springs, making them bitter and causing many to die. Likewise, the third bowl was poured out into the rivers and the springs, only instead of making them bitter, it made them turn to blood. The similarities are obvious. And we're going to find this to be true of the remaining bowls as well. All of them picture events that are similar to those found at the sounding of the trumpets, but the effects are more devastating. Whereas the trumpets affected only a portion of whatever they affected, usually a third, the bowls affected it all. All men who worshipped the beast were covered with swords. Everything that lived in the sea died. All those who poured out the saints' blood were forced to drink blood from the rivers and springs. Now, as with all the visions, we do have a couple of important questions that need to be asked. First of all, when does this take place? And are these events sequential? Does one always follow the other? Some would suggest they are. That these are the progressive judgments of God that lead to the final act of judgment. And that they will all come shortly before the end. However, the end was also pictured after the sounding of the trumpets and after the breaking of the seals and in many other visions in Revelation. This leads me to believe these acts of judgment are not reserved for the end times. They are pictures of how God pours out his wrath on unrepentant humanity all throughout history. And Romans 1.18 does make it clear that the wrath of God is now being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men. God isn't going to wait until judgment day to judge sin. He's doing so now. And those who fail to respond to his trumpets of warning, who refuse to repent, will feel the wrath whenever and however he chooses to express it during their life or after it. Whether we recognize it as such or not, many of the plagues that befall unrepentant humanity are direct acts of God, bowls of wrath that are now being poured out on deserving individuals and nations. The trumpets made it clear that many of the catastrophic events that happen are calls from God for repentance. And the bowls of wrath make it clear that the same things can be for some expressions of God's judgment. Now, only God knows the reason behind specific catastrophes. It's not our place to say why something happened. It's not within our purview to know which catastrophes are simply the effects of sin or which are trumpets or bowls of wrath. But scripture does make it clear that God uses catastrophic events to call men to repentance and to bring judgment upon disobedience. Now, this doesn't mean we should expect to see evil men break out with loathsome and malignant sores and rivers to be turned to blood. These visions aren't meant to be taken literally. They're symbolic of God's wrath. Pictures that express the wrath of God in very graphic ways. Visions that make it clear that God does express his wrath on unrepentant men and that no one will escape.
continue. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. Just as the fourth trumpet affected the heavenly bodies, so the fourth bowl affected the sun. But instead of making it grow dark, the bowl fired it up, making it scorch unrepentant men. The fact that this wasn't a warning intended to bring men to repentance can be seen by the reaction of those affected. They were so hardened that they responded by blaspheming the name of the God who has the power over these plagues. They didn't need their eyes opened. They knew they were responsible to God. And they knew God was behind what was befalling them. But they chose to blaspheme rather than worship him. This can also be seen in the fifth bowl. At the pouring out of the fifth bowl, the kingdom of the beast was darkened. Evil and its consequences overtook the light and all hope was gone. But those in pain just gnawed their tongues and refused to repent. And with bloody tongues, they blasphemed the God of heaven. They were beyond the point of repentance, and God knew it. So judgment began even while the beast was in power. But that kingdom was about to fall. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river, the Euphrates. And its water was dried up, that the way might be prepared for the kings of the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments, lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called har Armageddon. We've now come to Armageddon, or what's referred to as Har-Mageddon. We've come to the final battle that's described in dramatic detail in popular books about the last days. But let's not jump to any conclusions about the nature of this battle. At the sounding of the sixth trumpet, four angels were released from the Euphrates to stir armies into battle. And here, when the sixth bowl is poured out, we see the Euphrates drying up. This made it possible for the kings of the east to join up with the kings of the whole world and prepare for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. John said the kings were gathered together by three unclean spirits like frogs that came from the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. If we insist on making this a literal battle, it's going to be led by three frog-like creatures. But even those who take Revelation more literally than I do don't take the frogs literally. 
And there's no reason to insist that this is to be a literal battle fought on a physical battleground. Besides, we really don't know where Har Mageddon is. In Hebrew, Har means mountain. And Mageddon is generally thought to be the same as Megiddo. If that's true, Har Mageddon is the Mount of Megiddo. Several famous battles in the Old Testament did take place on the plains of Megiddo. And Marilyn and I were recently there, but there's no mountain on the plains of Megiddo. The closest thing to a mountain is a 13-acre mound that was formed by the rubble of 20 cities built on top of each other over the centuries. And you certainly couldn't get the 200 million horsemen pictured at the sixth trumpet on 13 acres. It's therefore unlikely that Har Mageddon is a physical location on earth. But if Megiddo is Megiddo, calling the battlefield the Mount of Megiddo could simply be painting a picture of a huge spiritual battleground. That's the case. This bowl primarily pictures the final confrontation between the forces of good and evil that takes place every time God's wrath is poured out and someone is eternally Condemned. Now, that's not to say that this can't also picture the final showdown between good and evil that will take place when Christ returns. But we'll get more into that in chapters 19 and 20. So let's move on to the seventh bowl. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. And the great city was split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And huge hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. As the seventh trumpet ushered in the reign of Christ and declared the judgment of the nations, so the seventh bowl pictured the fall of Babylon, Rome, and the final judgment. When islands and mountains will disappear and the earth will be cleansed and remade for the eternal reign of As we continue in our study of Revelation, we'll be given other visions that give more details of these events. So there's no need to pursue this any further today. Let's just draw this all to a close by once again visualizing the wrath of God as seen in the bowls of his wrath. As loathsome and malignant sores, as a sea of coagulated and putrid blood, as scorching heat and excruciating pain, as Armageddon and the final destruction of the earth. And then let's ask ourselves, if we want to face the wrath of God. If we don't, we better make certain 
we've repented. And that we have accepted the grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace made available through the sacrifice of Jesus. If we've not done so, we better do it while there is still time. Before smoke fills the temple of God and no one is any longer able to enter into his presence. The time is now to make sure your future. The time is now to accept that grace that's greater than all our sin. Let's celebrate this morning.